You're about to hear a presentation on fusion and warp drive propulsion research with a twist of anti-gravity and what happened to Ning Lee. This presentation is made by uh, Jason Cassabri, PhD at University of Alabama Huntsville. He is an associate professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering with the Propulsion Research Center. And he's got a whole team researching this stuff. It's an in-depth technical presentation, except for maybe discussion about Ning Lee and good Q&A sessions mixed in with it. This has got a lot of content in it. So if uh, you're interested in this kind of stuff, you want to watch. I'm Greg Allison with Galactic Gregs. Please subscribe, bang the subscription bell, and uh, click off. This presentation was made to the Huntsville, Alabama L5 Society, local chapter of the National Space Society, and was simulcasted with the National Space Society. Uh, let's orient on dimensions first. So uh, time, so we, we, we use the second as our basic unit of time, where does it come from? So uh, one second is defined as the uh, fixed numerical value of the cesium frequency, the unperturbed ground state of, oh shoot, I'm not, this is uh, getting in the way, let me get that out of the way. Hyperphane transition frequency of the cesium <laughs> atom, and I think that's about 9.19 gigahertz, or one hertz is equal to one second. That's where the, the second is now defined. Um, everything else is derivative of that. One hour is 3,600 seconds, a day is 24 hours, a Julian year is 365.25 days. And better than one better than one percent one year is approximately pi times ten to the seven seconds if you're trying to ballpark something while your friends just keep that in the back of your back pocket so now let's talk about length so length is actually defined based on the speed of light now so one meter is the distance traveled by light in one number uh, 299,792,458 seconds um, and meters are used you know, to measure spacecraft and launch vehicle scales. Uh, we use the foot and the kilometer. And then, there's, of course, there's the astronomical unit, where that is about 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters, roughly the distance between the sun and the Earth. And so for solar system scales, an AU is a very convenient unit of frequency. It goes from about 0 out to 100 for most of the things that we deal with. Um, and there's a more a precise a definition for an AU, but let's not get into that. Um, so on galactic scales, the light year is what we tend to use for the measurement. And I don't recall how many meters that is. I should have scientific notation. Uh, but it's the distance that light travels in a year. And these are huge, huge distances. Um, so our galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. Uh, in one nanosecond, light travels about a foot through vacuum. So in one nanosecond, one billionth of a second, light goes about this far. Uh, a parsec is another thing that you hear. Um, so, uh, you know, the Millennium Falcon, of course, that's scientifically based uh, uh, when, you know, uh, the, did the Kessel run in 11 parsecs or something like that. Um, but the way it's defined, it actually has to do with astronomy. So the Earth's rotation, um, uh, basically factors into that, and uh, it's an angle, uh, it's one, one AU subtends the angle of one arc second, and the parsec is defined based on that, and it's 206,000 uh, AU, or about 3.26 light years. So if you hear parsec use, um, that's where that comes from. So now let's get to the fun one, velocity. So we start with meter per second. Um, so we've already defined what meter per second is. Um, a mile per hour is about 0.447 meters a second. If you're trying to do this in your head, just take uh, miles per hour and divide by two and you get pretty close. Um, a kilometer a second is starting to think in terms of spacecraft for um, missions to the moon or missions to Mars and things like that. Those are kinds of the speeds that are involved, a, a, more, a little bit more than that, but that's getting close. So one click. Another uh, reference point is one kilometer per second. That's about Mach 3. Seven and a half kilometers a second is about low Earth orbit, orbit velocity. It's about Mach 23. The speed of light is about three times to the eight meters a second. That's the speed of light in a vacuum. And um, that also corresponds to about Mach 1 million. So if you're flying in the Earth's atmosphere at Mach 1 million, you're going the speed of light. You're also vaporized, but you know, uh, <laughs> at least you have a little plane of fame there. So now let's get to science fiction, and then we'll get on with uh, what we're up to uh, at UAH. So 
Warp speed is Star Trek. So the way uh, warp speed works, so there's, there's a physics basis for it. It's not been demonstrated experimentally yet that I'm aware of. Uh, but the basic idea is that you can warp or distort space-time uh, where you contract it in front of you and expand behind you. And we now know that space actually can expand faster than the speed of light. We can physically observe that. It doesn't mean that we can travel faster through the vacuum, but we can stretch and expand the, uh, the vacuum of space and cheat and go faster than light that way. So that's, that's our, uh, our hack to get through space-time if, if we can actually achieve that. So what does warp drive mean? So uh, next generation all modern content one to nine is given like roughly warp to the uh, warp to the cube or warp cube is basically the, the answer. And then there's all kinds of different variations on that. Um, hyperspace, which is in Star Wars, is a lot faster. And hyperspace is defined according to the um, screenwriters, for whichever movie TV show was out. So it moves as fast as a plot is needed. For the script writers to admit it's a story. <laughs> <It's a book. laughs> um, but to ballpark it, so a galaxy has a diameter of 100,000 uh, light year and it takes a week to cross the galaxy. That gives you about 5 million uh, C for, for um, hyperspace travel. And then there's one more most important one that's ludicrous speed. Um, and that's, you know, if you go ludicrous speed, you know that you go to Plaid. Uh, and uh, it's about 1,000 C uh, or roughly warp 8. And that's according to the peer-reviewed uh, Reddit article that I can find uh, to provide a definition. So, so there we go. So there, there's all that. Something to shoot for. So who are we? So um, the Charger Advanced Power Propulsion Laboratory is part of the Propulsion Research Center at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. So we are really good at smoke and fire, blowing, blowing smoke everywhere. Uh, this is an example. This is our, our supersonic wind tunnel over here. That's one of our facilities. And it's really just all about the people, uh, the past, present, and the, and the future, the students. We're here to train the students and help them uh, go out and have exciting careers and help them solve the next generation of uh, problems. So, um, but the thing that gets me out of bed uh, in the morning is the uh, excitement of, of working with fantastic uh, colleagues like Dr. Judy Schneider. Oh, you're here today. Oh my gosh, wow, that's what, how, that was lucky of me, right? Okay. <laughs> and second to that um, is the following. So this is the Flint River. So I'm not excited particularly about a random river, but just as a reference point, this is in Tennessee uh, and in Alabama. And uh, it flows about 2,000 gallons per second. Um, there's enough deuterium in the water. So, so water has this tiny fraction of the hydrogen in that water is deuterium. There's enough flowing through that river to sustain 20 terawatts of fusion power. So if you could burn it all, just that one river could power the entire world with what we draw on electricity right now. And everything that contains water, rivers, creeks, ponds, lakes, oceans, running faucets, clouds, plants, animals, they all contain deuterium. And if we can figure that out, we can figure out how to crack fusion, um, <clears throat> It, it just about democratizes energy because you've got water all over the planet uh, to be able to derive the fuel for creating electricity. So what is fusion? Uh, so fusion is when you combine the light elements together and then they make new elements and release a massive amount of energy in the process. So the easiest one to do, and I put that in big quotes, is deuterium with tritium. So deuterium is hydrogen and tritium is just a heavier isotope of hydrogen. When they merge and uh, fuse, they release a neutron and a helium uh, with a lot of energy. And so this is, this is kind of the basic idea. Now, I actually can't, I, I think I've had the honor of doing a how talk. This is my third trip here. And the last time, I was blabbing about this giant pulse power machine uh, that we had that I was so proud of. And so now let me talk about a colossal failure, okay? Uh, and what we learned from it. So we had this large, we had this opportunity to get a pulse power machine that was a leftover from a nuclear weapons effects program. The program is called the Decade Quad Facility, which was up at Arnold Engineering Development Center. We had the last prototype that was built before they cloned it and took four of them, connected them together, and had one of the largest pulse power capabilities in the world at the time. And uh, we were like, yeah, of course we want this machine, absolutely. So we collaborated with Boeing and brought it in and worked with NASA for about eight years, and it was a lot of fun. We learned a tremendous amount um, on, the, on the job. And this is some of the original group uh, 
uh, right here, assembling some of the machine. This is one of my former students, uh, Dr. now Dr. Ross Cortez. But um, what happened is, so we, we collaborated with NASA on this, and uh, it led to working on something called PUF, the Pulse Vision Fusion Hybrid concept. And we spent a number of years trying to figure out how to make that work and understand all of the physics. And uh, it possibly could lead to a much smaller propulsion system uh, because of the coupling between the fission and the fusion and how they kind of can help each other. As we got into the physics to figure out, to figure out what was required, we decided to reach out to the Department of Energy to say, these are the calculations that we're doing. Can you help us vet this and, and, and collaborate together? And they looked at the codes and our calculations and what you guys are doing a really good job. Now you have to stop it. So uh, <laughs> between that and then, them, uh, and then a tri-agency agreement to stop doing fission-fusion hybrid stuff as part of their advanced propulsion portfolio, that kind of killed that whole effort. So um, that sort of forced us to stop all of this effort. And so then I was stuck with, okay, I've got this giant machine. Now what do I do? You know, if we, if we can't go that direction, um, and this machine was very, very complicated in the first place. What can we do that's additive diffusion that might make this easier to do? So I started doing some calculations. I, I literally sat down in a chair in the middle of the lab going, huh, okay, how do, we, how do we dig out of this? And so I started doing these power balance calculations. It's just thermodynamics one, basically. And what you're looking at um, on the x-axis is number density. So, the air in this room has a number density of about 10 to the 25 particles per cubic meter. Let's count them together. Okay, no. Uh, the y-axis is temperature, and it's in funny units. It's in uh, kiloelectron volts. One electron volt is 11,605 Kelvin, very, very hot. At about 1 eV is when you start to get ionization of the atmosphere. So things that come through reentry are of temperatures of the order of 1 to 2 eV. As they, as they enter Earth's atmosphere. And it's because of that ionization that we have that, um, that communication blackout during part of the reentry. So, but anyway, what this is saying is that if you have a fusion plasma um, and you're trying to burn it, uh, if you have no implosion velocity but you can have all the temperature that you want, there's this little space over here if your plasma is small, like two millimeters, for example, that actually burns. This is where NIF lives. This is the National Ignition Facility where they, they're getting all of the, the headlines. So their densities are uh, about 100 times solid density at peak compression. So just tremendously high pressures. Um, and this is without any magnetic field. And this is the this color over here is colored on energy. So how much thermal energy is actually in that plasma? And so like over here, just a, a two millimeter plasma, basically just like a little BB, has some maybe 10 gigajoules of energy in it, or just the, the NIF actually isn't that large, it's more like a, a megajoule, but just you know, just think how much energy is packed, thermal energy packed into this little target. So I said, okay, so let's crank up the magnetic field and see how this space opens up for us. Because as you increase the magnetic field and increase the implosion velocity, what happens is this boundary that you're looking at is telling you the blue region is where it cools off. That's why I picked that color deliberately. Blue is going to be cold. Anything else warms up. And this dash boundary is where it means that you can get into fusion relevant temperatures. It's a really, really hard part about fusion is getting into these high temperatures. So if you can crank up the speed and crank up uh, the magnetic field in the target, you can start to open that space wide up. And so I realized, wait a minute. I could, instead of having these really exotic large machines that have pulse compression uh, in order to try to get to these, these high density regimes, which is what we've been shooting for for years, and we started rethinking this, like, maybe we could get to just really high magnetic fields and go in a much lower density regime. And so once I realized that, and I started calculating how much energy is in that system and just kind of playing with the numbers, I realized that we could kind of operate in a real hybrid between uh, magnetic fusion energy like tokamax and the extreme inertial confinement fusion and possibly have a small scale reactor that breaks even. And so that's what we're working on um, right now. That's, that's kind of what we're trying to develop. And so a lot of what we're going to talk about today is kind of some of the tools and the things that we've done along the way towards that goal. Um, so one of the things that just pains me is the joke, uh, fusion is the technology of the future. It always will be. 
And, uh, uh, and it's, it is frustrating because it's true. I've been working at this for so long, uh, you know, and, and I, my part of it is small compared to the whole history. But if you plot all of the progress on one chart, you can see that we're actually marching towards break even. We're actually tracking better than Moore's law in terms of how much um, energy output is coming from these reactors. So if you go back, this is where it got declassified. People started working openly on fusion. So right here around 1958. Um, and then you have all these different experiments that came online and marched forward. And here we are um, in 2024. So this, this picture here was generated in, uh, in 2020 by um, Sam Orzel and uh, Scott Shu, who uh, work at Department of Energy and help come up with the policies for the nation on, uh, on fusion. And so they, they published this. Uh, just, uh, Dr. Shu is the lead fusion coordinator for uh, uh, Office of the Undersecretary for Science and Innovation at uh, DOE. And so this just kind of shows the, the, the rate of progress and how things are going towards break even. So you can kind of forecast we should be there in the 2030s. So we're getting really, really close now, but we have to work really hard to make sure that these trends continue. So we'll talk about what we're going to be doing within that. But things are changing very, very quickly. Um, I made this chart just a year ago where over 35 uh, fusion companies had formed and there was almost $5 billion in investment. And now I've lost count of how many fusion companies are out there. There's, I think, somewhere around 70, maybe. And so there's, I think, a few billion that have been thrown in on top of this private investment. So things are changing and progress is being made very, very quickly. So it's an exciting time to be in it. So some of the prominent companies that are out there, you've got Commonwealth Fusion. So of that $5 billion, I would say like 30% of it just goes to this one company. Uh, they have a, a, a tremendous amount of investment, but they have a lot of credibility behind their concept. And so what changed and enabled them to do this is a similar failure. Um, they, uh, they were part, they were, this, is a, this is an MIT group that uh, uh, have always been part of the magnetic confinement and stuff. So, Tokamaks are basically like magnetic donuts, so the plasma is basically a donut shape. And so uh, when ITER, the International Thermonuclear Engineering Reactor, uh, was starting to be built, all of the money, most of the money that went into our fusion program started to go to that. And so a lot of the, the domestic fusion uh, participation went away. The, the budgets were zeroed out just because we couldn't afford to do that and everything else that we had. And uh, they didn't want to get out of the action, so they scratched their heads and started thinking, well, what can we do? And they, they actually worked on uh, superconducting magnets and helped develop the technology to lead to <coughs> magnets that could get to 20 to 40 Tesla at, at pretty high temperatures. And so they completely revolutionized superconducting um, capabilities because of that, because they were motivated. And that now leads to a smaller reactor, and so now they've got a lot of investment because of that hard work. Um, helion is, so they're in Massachusetts, so Helion is on the other side of the United States, <coughs> in Washington. There's, I think, a half a dozen fusion companies up there, so I don't know, maybe they got extra deuterium in the water that motivates them or something here. Have a little deuterium myself, hang on. Okay, better. So anyway, Helion is probably, oops, I got it. Stop doing that. Uh, Helion is probably the largest company in fusion on the West Coast. And their concept, they form a plasma, kind of a, kind of a donut like a tokamak, but it's a pulse system. So they form it, they shoot it in into this little chamber, and then they compress it down with additional magnets. And so they're making some very interesting progress, and they have their own what they call capacitor kitchen, where they cook up new capacitors to help, help with this. So they, they've got a really well-funded program. Um, this is just a roadmap. I think I'm going to skip this and kind of get into the portfolio and what I'm in, portfolio and what I'm interested in actually. So the fuel sources that people propose um, are all over the place. Most of them are deuterium tritium. So of the 35 companies that I had listed, statistically 22 of them were doing deuterium tritium. Five are doing people are on 11, and um, then there's a mixture of deuterium and PBAR11 and d helium free. The reason the deuterium tritium is picked is because it's the easiest fuel to burn by order of magnitude. Um, and then PBAR11 is a not a close second, but has the next highest level of uh, participation is because it doesn't make any neutrons. Neutrons are terrible. 
You make uh, you, you burn a plasma, it makes neutrons, and all those great materials that you came up with slowly start changing over time. Like sometimes they just they crack because of neutron embrittlement, and sometimes they turn into different elements because uh, the neutrons will transmute and just change it into something else, and they can make it radioactive. So neutrons are really hard to deal with, but people are eleven is so hard. <coughs> that I'm not sure that anyone's really going to get there anytime soon with it. So, but we'll, we'll see. I'm glad that people are working on it. Um, so what are we doing in Fusion? So our main efforts that we've been involved in recently, uh, plasma jets driven by inertial fusion is one of them. And so this is a collaboration with Los Alamos, Hyperjet Fusion, uh, University of New Mexico, and Spaceway, which is a company in Florida. And it's funded by Department of Energy, Opera E, and NASA. And we have this cartoon down here that shows, this is actually a simulation that we did, um, uh, which it prototyped on this machine, actually, right here, um, in which we have a three-dimensional implosion of 36 plasma jets and uh, six jets that are magnetized by those external solenoids. So the field lines that you see, the blue things are magnetic fields, and you can see as the plasma comes in, they're conductive and it distorts that field, so it sweeps up the magnetic field and compresses it. And that's uh, one of the merits of magneto-inertial fusion is that the field acts like an insulator trapping the electrons, which release the energy otherwise. So that's really important. And uh, it took us about a decade to develop a code that could do these types of calculations on a machine this small. So uh, this, this is a, a, like in the last couple of years, this is sort of a new capability that we've had. It's taken a tremendous amount of work um, and a, a lot of grad students uh, sweating with me over, over trying to get this uh, functional. So the other company that we work with is Near Star Fusion. And this is a, a hybrid of gradient field and impact fusion. And it's derived from actually a NASA propulsion concept uh, they're based in Virginia, and the funding so far has come from Department of Energy, the State of Virginia, Private Investment, and National Science Foundation. And um, the basic idea is they have a, a, a railgun that shoots a projectile up to about 10 kilometers a second. Um, it runs into a chamber, and the details of what happens in that chamber are proprietary. Pretty cool. We're working on it. I can't say much more about it at the moment. Um, but this, this, uh, this is something I'm very, very excited about, and uh, we're hoping to make a lot of good progress on that this summer. So when, when, when we can talk about it, uh, we get good results, you'll, you'll hear from me. Um, so now that takes us to our next step. So we had to move out of the lab on the arsenal um, because SMDC took over the building and their priorities shifted. So we're like, okay, we can't squat here anymore. So we moved what we could up to campus and decided to focus on smaller, slower, simpler machines. And the main machine that we focused on is this mobile thing that the kids named Sparky. So Sparky is a 60 kilojoule, 40,000 volt capacitor. <coughs> and um, this machine was, it, so this, this room was supposed to be a, a room intended for, I think it was like kind of like a medical center or something. Did any of my students know the history? Yeah, I, I, I don't really know what it was for, but um, they were going to condemn all of these buildings and start doing major construction, and then the pandemic hit and halted it, and so we basically got to work in a condemned building until the, the pandemic lifted. So, so you know, you mixed feelings. You don't want to see everybody get sick and all of that, but it was nice to have the building for a while. So we moved our entire lab, or most of it, up to here for about a year, a uh, year and a half. Uh, and then, and then, uh, then we had to move again to our more permanent home. But along the way, we picked up a very interesting project in Fission, which is why I added Fission to the title. Um, so this is a CAD drawing of, of an experiment called the Ant Farm. And uh, when we started doing this, and people say, what, what kind of work are you doing? You know, if we're at a restaurant, I'd take my straw, put it in the water, and just blow bubbles and say, we're doing this for NASA. <laughs> you know? um, so what, what is it actually? Um, so it's derived from any, any great idea you had was thought of in the 60s and 70s, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So this is, this is a liquid molten state uranium uh, nuclear thermal rocket. And so the idea is that you have a bunch of these cores that are spinning to centrifugally confine the uranium. And the point being, the hotter the temperature, the faster the exhaust velocity of the gas. So you can, say, travel to Mars faster or travel with a higher payload mass fraction. 
Um, and so they decided to resurrect that and start funding it, so we had the pleasure of getting to work on it. So this little spinning um, animation here is, uh, uh, is basically one of the possible fuel elements. And so there's two variations that we're looking at. One in which each fuel element is sort of separated and it's an individual element with its own nozzle, and another one in which they're common and then they all go through one nozzle. I'm not really sure which concept's going to win yet. So we have to understand how the hydrogen can bubble through that liquid uranium and then go out into a nozzle. And um, this is harder than the fusion stuff that I do, <laughs> trying to get all of this to work. So the first thing that we did is we tried to duplicate uh, the work that they had in the ant farm, and uh, there's a young gentleman um, hiding back there who, who successfully was able to benchmark our code against that. How oh, good is embarrassing him? Good, good. Um, then next up, uh, there's a new experiment that they're developing called the blender, uh, in which they basically take the ant farm and they spin it up to 7,000 RPM. They don't have it spinning that hard just yet, but they're getting there, and they're going to feed the gas sideways as a way to kind of approximate that spinning cylindrical drum. So uh, we modeled that, and this is, this, is, this is probably the single hardest model we've ever developed, is, is trying to come up with a planar enclosure and a liquid inside and modeling liquid with bubbles coming into it. That's, we're working on that right now, but so far we're, we're doing okay with it, and the liquid is separating out and going off the walls. We haven't really gotten into tracking the bubbles yet, but that's part of the progress. And then we're also doing the cylindrical one in which you, you see here, this is like a, a subset version. And so, but anyway, we've, we've got it working. We just have to make the physics better. But that's, that's where we are with that. We're one tiny part of a huge national project on that. That's kind of exciting. And so this, is, this was last year's nuclear emerging technologies for space um, picture. And so here's, here's some of our, uh, our, our grad students. And, uh, um, I think, oh, no, no, I'm here. I thought I was going to not be in this picture, but yeah, I'm, I'm there. So, okay. So now, we moved out to the airport. I think when they realized we were trying to do fusion and nuclear reactions, they said, yeah, let's, let's move you a few miles away from campus. Um, there just really was no space on at UAH for all the, the equipment that we had. So we moved us out to a hexagon-owned facility, um, and we're about to renew our rental out there, so we're very excited. So we, we got our own mailbox, and we felt like we made the big time now. Um, and this is basically what our lab looks like. So we have these pallet racks to kind of hold most of the equipment uh, that we have. And so that actually takes up quite a bit of space. Um, and so here's Sparky. Sparky has been moved over. And um, thanks to uh, a, a lot of our students, and I'll say the lead on this was taken by uh, Jacob Kinsey and Logan Towers on getting this machine operational in the new facility. I think Logan is, is here with us today, and uh, Logan just got his uh, master's thesis defended on the, uh, on, on the machine. So we, we, we did a number of shots with the machine, and we did one where we said, let's try lithium deuteride just to see what happens. Because uh, our instrumentation wasn't quite ready yet. Uh, but we did a shot, and we measured before and after with the background, and we did slightly activate the chamber. Uh, it, it seemed like. So we, we kind of did something. It's very, very safe. We, we have uh, <clears throat> a lot of uh, uh, safeguards in place and, and uh, detectors and things. So we, we, uh, we didn't do any harm to anything, but we, we think we actually did real fusion for the first time here recently. But now that we think that we can do that, we're, we're going to be a lot more rigorous about everything. So we're developing our diagnostic system and trying to come up with a better source and we're working with the radiation safety officer. So we're very excited about this. Um, and so we also have a, an assortment of high voltage equipment. Um, this is a, uh, a Tesla coil uh, that we have firing and we took the dome off of it. Uh, uh, obviously for no reason other than just to make cool sparks so we can have a picture. Um, and then we're refurbishing these uh, um, high voltage power supplies that will take us from, we can go to zero to 60,000 right now and with the yellow one we can go to plus or minus 100,000. So we're, we're working on, on that. Um, and this is most of our team. We've got a few uh, new people that have been added. Uh, one or two of them are here uh, today. I think, hey, how you doing? <laughs> uh, but anyway, this is, this is a lot of our, our, our team right now. So, questions so far? Okay, thank you for not following the scene just yet. Oh, 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 uh, yep, yep. Pull away. I'm, I'm reminiscing about Dr. Cole's work back in the day. 
when they were trying to do antimatter and everyone was worried there's going to be a black hole generated and we'll all disappear here in Huntsville. Remember those days? I do. Okay. Yeah. Well, I came out to your lab and, and uh, I visited and I thought it was fascinating working on stuff. So now I, I, I see this, this cool project you're doing kind of going away. Can you give us a tidbit of what the sensitivities are of that? Sure. Okay, so I'll actually redact certain things. But okay, so the idea behind the fission fusion hybrid is that if you get the fusion part burning, like fusion is very rich in, in producing neutrons, right? And so uh, while fission is kind of poor in producing neutrons, you have to do a lot in order to manage that budget. And so if you can get the fusion to burn and generate neutrons, then if they couple into the um, the uranium or whatever material, we looked at a, a other, other materials as well. Um, I'm sure as we Googled it, we got on somebody's list in the process, but um, so the, uh, the fast neutrons will fission with both uranium-238 and 235. They have cross sections to burn both and release a tremendous amount of energy. But you have to have a pretty long distance for those neutrons to travel through solid in order to get them to um, actually burn, have a good probability of burning. So in order to get around that and have a smaller pellet, you've got to compress beyond solid density. And that gets you to, can't finish the sentence, <laughs> but that it, it gets into an issue where it, it runs too close into other applications. And at the same time, the energies required to achieve that turn out to require a huge pulse power facility. So you lose the ability to shrink it down because you have to compress the solid uh, to, uh, it's hard enough to compress any solid, but the, hard, the farther you go up on the periodic table, the worse it gets. Because there's just this huge electron cloud and you push on it and all those electrons are kind of pushing back and it just makes it really hard. Makes, makes certain properties go up very, very quickly. And so you just can't, can't deal with it. So we didn't really lose out on some big important, I mean, it was a great project but there's other ways to do basically that same thing, and we think we have a better path now to make it smaller. But we wouldn't have known that had we not spent all that time going through all the math and all that. Um, it's closely related to like Orion. I'm sure you're familiar with Orion. And Orion, they didn't want to do either because uh, that's based, Orion is a concept in which you would detonate atomic bombs, and, uh, and there's almost no better propulsion system out there, but you have a nuclear fallout every time you did a launch. Or if you just take it all to space and do it from space, um, it would take a lot of launches to assemble that vehicle. And now you would have a bunch of bombs in space. And so if we did it, we're like, well, this is just for science. And other countries would go, yes, us too. We, this is just for science. And so then we would have this big arms race. And nobody wants that. And so it just, it, it's just politically a non-starter for that reason. And PUFF is not, you can't really weaponize the PUFF concept but it's in that family of things where politicians go, ooh, I don't want this. Yeah, so that's kind of what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, Question, other, uh, yes, blue. Oh, sorry. I'm not about this, okay. Uh, what is PV11? Uh, oh, oh, P for protons, hydrogen, and, and V11 is uh, boron. Okay, so it's one of the, so boron, which uh, any, most of your laundry detergent has borax in it, and so that's, I forget the, the levels, but boron 10 and boron 11 are both really, really common isotopes, and they're, they're found in laundry detergent. I'm getting some kind of weird feet. Okay, that's better. Uh, Robin, did you have a question? Yes, I did. I was wondering, um, what is the energy range of the neutrons? And have you noticed the minimum energy that causes damage to the materials? Very good question. And um, for fusion, the deuterium trading <coughs> reaction makes a 14.1 um, a MeV neutron. So it's a massive amount of energy, and it'll dislocate up to 50 atoms in a lattice, or typically. So it, it does a lot of damage. Uh, the next one down for deuterium, it makes every other reaction that occurs is 3.5 MeV. It'll make one of those. And it'll still do damage. Um, <clears throat> and then at low, and so the absorption cross sections typically are much lower energy, so they have to be moderated first. Um, 
and at those lower energies then it can basically transmute elements and so any system that you have has to be designed to account for that knowing that the neutrons are going to walk their way in and then get absorbed into stuff and change the, uh, the contents and so um, the way we handle it in our lab let's see oh here we go okay you see these little blue containers so they're filled with borax and then once they're full of borax you pour water in um, and get it as dense as you possibly can and and uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Thaggard over there is laughing because he's the one that actually poured the borax in for most of them I think and uh, <laughs> thank you did a good job and so what happens is that the neutrons come out they they get scattered and attenuated by the hydrogen they slow down and then they get absorbed into the boron and then they react and form a new component which is stable but then they release a gamma ray when they do that so you have to shield for the neutrons with hydrogen and then you have to shield the, the secondary gamma rays with lead after that so the shielding is very very complicated when it comes to neutrons as you know <laughs> good question uh, other questions before I move on? Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. What is it working? I know that at least one fusion company is uh, is using a lithium um, blanket, mm -hmm. a liquid a liquid lithium blanket, rotating around much as their much as you're planning to oh, rotate um, the uranium fuel inside the uh, inside the drugs, and they're using that as a uh, neutron shield. Have you looked into that? Is um, is that something that's feasible? Yeah, you're talking about a lithium blanket as a way to, I think what they're doing is using the lithium to uh, shield the neutrons and then uh, generate tritium from that. Because tritium is a really important fuel, but it doesn't exist naturally. You have to breed it. So reactors would basically are, are designed to try to breed tritium and then, <coughs> and then recycle that tritium back in. And so I think you're talking about first light fusion and what they have uh, is... General fusion. General fusion. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's different. They're, yeah, they're the one doing this steampunk concept of using pistons <laughs> yes. to uh, compress a uh, plasma. Yeah, they, they are actually one of the very first private fusion companies. Um, and, uh, and so in their concept, they, uh, they use explosives to drive these metal pistons to uh, compress and magnetize a uh, target. And the, the piston serves two functions. One is to compress the target, and the other is to also breed tritium and shield against the neutrons. And so, yeah, that's that's what their concept is, and it's it's rooted in another concept called Linus, which existed years before that, mostly just on paper. Um, but you can look up Linus or General Fusion and you kind of get the gist of what they were doing with that. Um, so uh, let's talk about why we should go to Mars. So um, I always like to share the sun to give an advanced propulsion talk because uh, like a lot of times when you, when you hear talks on advanced propulsion, people kind of give those mom and pop, oh, it's inspiring, you know, we've got to do this. But, but the, the reality is it's very expensive, and so you need some real substantive reasons to give to politicians so they can figure out why to spend money on their thing instead of something else. And so really it comes down to if you want to study something like Mars, it's hard to beat the human brain. It's really what it comes down to. So humans are basically, our brains are like 20 petaflop supercomputers, and they only need about 100 watts to run. I mean, there's nothing that comes close to that capability. So a lot faster speed and efficiency to optimize field work, and we have the agility and dexterity because we have hands and things to do things. Um, the on-site team can overcome communication problems. Is everything okay? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think what happened is when we had Bert speaking. Yeah. I think we switched the source of the mic. I was doing. Okay. So, okay. Just I don't know if that's easy to search back. <clears throat> so there's a communication lag. So if you go to uh, Mars, depending on where Earth and Mars are, you've got between six and twenty minutes uh, communication transit time. So it's really hard. You can't just do stuff. You can't say, "Hey, why don't you go look at that rock over there?" You, you've got. You know, it could be 40 minutes um, before the, uh, the command is issued versus, you know, what they do. So you really need some autonomy 
And so it really helps to have people. So that's, that's kind of what one of the things that motivates me in terms of crude space travel and how to make it better. So here's our neighborhood. And I put it on astronomical unit measurements. Because remember I said earlier the link scale that we think of for the solar system is 1 AU. Because uh, Mars is like a half a AU away from us. Um, and then Jupiter is about 5 AU out and so on and so forth. And just look at this. So we've been to the moon, and we're going to go back soon. Um, and that's only 0 0.001 to 0 0.002 AU out. So we're just barely, it's so hard to do that, we're just barely scratching the surface of exploration uh, beyond Earth. Most of what we do is in that tiny little cyan-colored circle right there. And pretty soon, with Artemis II, we're going to send people back, not to land on the moon, but at least to circle out and, and go this way. So it's very exciting to get to do that. But then we look at the scales, we see if we put this on a log scale. So here we are at Earth, and we've got this, this huge um, region that we can't explore. This is our nearby celestial neighborhood. Um, and these are all the worlds, and this is another thing that really strikes me. So we, we get excited about Mars, but I also think a lot about um, all the other worlds that are about the size of the moon or a little bit smaller. Most of them are kind of far out, most of them are cold, and they have a gravity that's about 10% of, of, uh, of our gravity. And there's a many, many of them to go visit. And I, I, th I think about this a lot, because I think about, you know, what could we do on those planets? Could we dwell there? Could we do things? Could we, um, you know, is there, is there value to it? Probably, maybe not at the moment. But I, I do think a lot about um, these, as, maybe not Mercury, that one might be a little toasty for us, but the, the rest of them, uh, I, I think about the possibilities of, of visiting some of these other places and what, what might be there. So I did this calculation um, for this talk. This is a walk through the solar system. I did this uh, two days ago. And so you can kind of see as we, we zoom out just to kind of get a sense of scale. That last the orbit there was Sedna, which has a huge, huge orbit of like 3600 uh, AU. And now we have the Oort cloud uh, coming in at about 100,000 AU. Now we have the nearest stars. And then we see the ones that were um, uh, sort of highlighted here, those are the habitable ones. So we have actually a good number of stars uh, in the habitable zone. But now let's look at this chart figure out what technologies to get to all these places. So on the y-axis, we have delta V. That's roughly how fast do you need the spacecraft to go. And on the x-axis is the energy density of the fuel needed in order to do those missions. And this blue line is just an approximation, but it really does capture a lot of physics this way, of how fast the exhaust velocities need to be coming out the vehicle in order to practically do that mission. So in other words, you could use the chemical propulsion system and go to the next star, but if you try to do it fast, you're going to have like a posted stamp worth of payload uh, in order to get there, or you're going to have a very, 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 very large system. So you really need an exhaust velocity that's comparable to the delta V, that's the assumption in this curve. So starting at the bottom. Lunar round trip in a week. We can do that. That's chemical propulsion. If you look at the intersection here, chemical energy density is around 10 to the 7 joules per kilogram. Mars round trip in two years also can be done with chemical. It's pushing the limits, but you can stage things and put things out of the destination and refuel there maybe and kind of help close that mission. Um, it starts to get easier if you start looking at nuclear technologies, though, because you have better energy density, you have a higher specific impulse. And so now you really kind of need something that can give you about a thousand seconds ISP to do that. Mars round trip in six months, now you're talking you need at least two or three thousand seconds ISP. Now you're pushing beyond the limits of nuclear thermal propulsion. You need something better. You need um, nuclear electric, if you could get the size of the electric system and the radiators down, or you need fusion, and then you start pushing out a Titan sample return in two years, a heliopause flyby, or a cloud gravitational lensing in 10 years, and all of these need uh, enormous specific impulses, like 10,000 seconds, 100,000 seconds, and simultaneously it needs energy densities that keep going up and up and up in order to do that. And so nuclear can kind of do some of this. Um, fusion, uh, so nuclear, I lump fission and fusion together, but fusion of the two of them can really give you higher specific impulse and good, uh, good thrust um, and the delta V in order to get there. So it kind of gets you here, and then there's a gap of, there's not a lot of missions that I'm aware of that we could do here that have a lot of value, 
and until we start looking at the next stars. And even with going to stars, we're really pushing fusions limits at this point. Like you could maybe do something in 50 to 100 years. Um, but uh, you, in order to really do it like that, you'd have to stage it. And I hate to throw away a perfectly good fusion reactor, uh, but you know, if we must. Um, but it really kind of becomes impractical uh, even for that. So you have to kind of look to things that are more exotic, like antimatter, laser, light craft, if, that, if you can make that work, or um, warp drive. So now let's back up. Let's, let's, let's change gears and talk about something else that interests me, um, and that is the microgravity environment. So we've kind of got that managed, but what astronauts have to do is they have to work out for two hours solid a day in order to keep from really um, deteriorating too much due to the microgravity. Um, so it's a solvable problem at least for a year, but now if we look to going to Mars, um, what we're worried about is once they get to Mars, are they going to have to have uh, therapy on the site before they can really do their work? You know, we don't know, but we know that the, the, the health risks in being in microgravity are, are pretty significant. The bone loss, the muscle weakening, cardiovascular deconditioning, etc. Um, and so, if we can do something about that, I want to. So, these arguments here actually came from uh, Dr. Torrin Clark, who does um, uh, uh, anti-gravity countermeasures. They have a centrifuge out there, so they do a lot of research in that area. But we came across something else that we realized we could leverage all of our pulse power power supplies to do. And that is using something called dielectrophoresis. So what is that? Um, I've, I've worked on it for a number of years now, and I still need Google's help to spell it right. Um, but basically what it is, is you have a gradient in an electric field. Okay, so you take a, a power supply and literally just here's, here's an electrode and here's another one. Let's make one flat and one of them small over here. And you can see how the field lines kind of coalesce to a point. So there's clearly a strong electric field gradient. The lines of force are tighter over here than they are over there. What does that do? Well, what happens is um, the molecules, everything can be polarized. And so let's say the field lines are left to right. And the molecule or the atom orients itself so that slightly more uh, field or slightly more of its charge is attracted to the stronger side of the field and um, it's sort of like a tug of war and this side wins and so it always tends to go into the direction of the stronger side of the force. There are exceptions and the, the young gentleman that I was bragging about earlier that did the modeling of the bubbles is also uh, my foremost expert on dielectrophoresis and all the exceptions to the rule. So um, he's, he's, uh, I'm not going to be able to get rid of him anytime soon. Um, but some of the applications of dielectrophoresis are mostly on the small size, the particle size, and medical applications. And it's really neat. They use hundreds of volts in these small scales and they can separate uh, cancer from regular tissue or bacteria from cells and things like that. It's really cool what they can do. And I found out about this and I said, don't they use hundreds of volts? I wonder what you can do with 40,000 volts. And, um, uh, and, and actually, there was a, an aerospace application of this, and I found the paper and I read it, and it said the author was Jim Blackman. And Jim Blackman literally was my office neighbor two doors down, and he doesn't know when to retire, so he just keeps working, um, as, as a lot of us do, I think, in, in Huntsville. So, um, so I went and talked to him about it, and he had a lot of great things to say. But so during the pandemic, this is when I thought about it, and as one does, um, for your birthday, you treat yourself to a high voltage power supply uh, and you set things up on a ping pong table because, you know, I had free time. This, this is dangerous things that happen. And this is not a very good movie, but this was one of the first things that I got to be successful. And you see, that's a ping pong ball. And what I was able to do was to pick up the ping pong ball and the marble did a strange thing and kind of wandered around. But I was able to figure out how to set up something to lift it up. So the uh, the rod here was at one voltage, and then the beam, uh, and then the, uh, the aluminum foil at the bottom, I think, was at ground, and that, that's what I did there. But it worked if you reverse the polarity and still pick it up. And so I thought, I think we have something here. Um, and then I tried a lot of other weird things, like uh, 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 just just the rod by itself. And um, I was I tried to set up something that I could see if I could just tilt something over because I couldn't pick up things in general. And, uh, and so I, I, there's a rod here, and then this is insulated by, uh, there are these blue PVC pipes you can get at Lowe's, they're for plumbing, I think, 
and they just happen to work really, really well as an insulator. So, so once I kind of had a rough idea, oh, okay, we have something here, um, then we started getting into trying to do something a little bit more rigorous with what we could do on a budget of basically zero. Um, so we developed a 3D code to allow us to be able to calculate electric field. This is the, this doesn't really do a whole lot other than we you know, have the ability to do that now. And that allows us to calculate the forces. And then we were able to come up with a stand um, that allowed us to quantify how much force, how much effective uh, acceleration we could exert on different objects. And one of the things that was the most challenging about this is the arcing. Because if it arcs, you lose the electric field, you're done, and it, and it quits. So we had to solve that problem. And uh, a student that has since graduated, uh, her name was uh, Savannah Flaherty, she came up to me one day, kind of sheepishly goes, this might be stupid, but have you ever thought about maybe using art clay? Because we could try all these different shapes and just kind of sculpt things around it. And I went, hey, let's try it. And it worked perfectly. So the, the next best thing is this uh, high voltage putty, which costs 10 times as much. So this was perfect. We can go to Walmart and get all of it and bring it home <clears throat> and just sculpt these things. And we could bake them into ceramic parts. It was really, really, really neat. And so this is an example of one that I think either Savannah or Boom uh, built. And, uh, <clears throat> and so we put Velcro on a little wooden pole and we tried um, <clears throat> marbles, wood, glass, clay, uh, I think avocado, banana, chicken, just anything that we could find to see. And so we were able to actually generate about a third of Earth's gravity uh, uh, using a 40,000 volt power supply. So that, that got us very, very excited. And so now we're in the middle of trying to get to, we, we've written proposals, we're trying to get this funded, but we're trying to get to the point where we actually can pick up something large. So that, that's the goal. So to do that, we're going to have to get to well over 100,000 volts and it gets a lot harder because the, the number of power supplies available get much more expensive and the ability to, to suppress the arcing is uh, a lot harder to do as well. So, but we're working on that and that's, that's kind of where we are at the moment. But our interest is in can we make this safe for humans to serve as an artificial gravity environment? And so that's what we're looking at um, right now. And there's a lot of work that's done on that. Line workers are frequently around high voltage power lines, so they're in similar electric environments, um, and there's a lot of data that's available. It's not clear that this is safe or not yet, so an element of the research, I don't see us doing that anytime soon, but an element would have to be um, on making sure that this is safe for people. But so far, it appears that as long as you're at frequency below 100 kilohertz, um, it's, it's okay, unless you get shocked. That, that, that's a problem, and we obviously want to uh, mitigate that as well. We have some, some ideas for how to prevent that. So, so that's one of the things that we're working on. Um, so we are going to present for okay. this. Is a okay, I see what just happened. Um, I borrowed some old slides, and I think I had embedded recordings on that. So I, I thought I got rid of all of those, but I see that. Uh, I was like, how am I cloning myself? Where, where am I coming from? <clears throat> it's a, another, you know, me from a different reality that's kind of visit, I guess. Okay, so um, let's talk. The last thing I want to talk about before I get into the breakthrough stuff um, is uh, the pulse magnetic nozzle work that we're doing, which is derivative of the puff stuff. So it's not dead. We're just we're just doing it uh, as pure fusion at this point, and so. If you want to turn a fusion propulsion a fusion system into a propulsion system for pulse, you have to figure out how to take an explosion and turn it into thrust, and that is very very difficult because the plasmas are extremely high. So the cartoon illustration of it is that you have a plasma that explodes into some kind of a magnetic field. These these uh, X's and O's represent coils that spiral around the shape of a nozzle, and the cartoon image is always then okay the plasma will do that push the field out of the way and go out the nozzle and everything's fine and um, the state of the art has been up, up to this point whether you're modeling or experiments that we know how to make a terrible not working at all nozzle so um, so it was only a few years ago that we were actually able to get our code to be able to do something and come up with a topology um, that would actually give us thrust um, so um, and then on top of it, this thing has to somehow produce electrical power to recharge the system for the next shot. So there's a lot of really complicated things that have to go on. 
So we came up with a model in which, let's say we take a little chunk of plasma, it runs into the coils. Um, if it compresses that flux, so here's where the voltage is induced on those coils, it drives through an inductor, through a transformer, and then pulse recharges a, uh, a capacitor rate. And so we're able to come up with a space over which we can do this and both uh, recover enough power to recharge the system and um, get propulsion for uh, travel. So it's very, very difficult, but everything, if you tune it just right, uh, you, you should be able to get this. And this is just a model of um, what the current and voltage waveforms look like. And the capacitor rate, which had just done, in this case, it was a puff system, where it, it delivered this huge amount of current to ignite it and create an explosion. Then the explosion comes back and runs through a circuit and charges the system to reset it back to uh, 40 kilovolts again. So it, so it can be done. Um, and so now we're, we're working with NASA on uh, further modeling on this to try to improve it. And this is what we have at the moment. This is, this is where we think uh, we're going to need to go with this. So the coil is a hybrid of two things. One is windings that go along the length, and then there's another spiral. The spiral is going to be best for the flux compression to get power and then the, the axial coils actually uh, are what give it propulsion, what give it thrust. And so I have a little movie here of a simulation that we did where you can see how the, as the plasma explodes, it distorts the field, um, and it's kind of coming out here. Uh, now, in full disclosure, right after this, the code crashed. So, you know, uh, <laughs> we're, we're making progress. We're going to, uh, as soon as the semester is over, you know, they, they insist that I show up for class. Uh, and you know, blah blah blah, great finals and all that kind of stuff. Uh, <clears throat> but once that's over, we'll get back to uh, working on this and trying to make improvements on, on these models. And we're working with uh, Dr. Gabe Shu, uh, one of my colleagues, and, and they're doing experiments. And um, so we're trying to duplicate their experiments and then scale it up to see how a full blown system would operate. So we're really excited about uh, getting to do this work. Questions before we get on onto this? Yes. Yeah. Well, I've heard that. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. Well, I know that NASA is also doing research on using. Um, uh, they're doing research on on um, using uh, fields to protect astronauts from radiation. And one of the ideas they came up with is a grid of a statically. Uh, Basically, a grid of statically charged uh, points, mm -hmm. and what 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 it would do is it take these uh, you know, these charged ionized particles and kind of kind of nudge them in a uh, like a in a, a base, you know if it's coming right straight at them, it kind of nudge them off to the side so it would miss the spot where the astronauts is. Mm -hmm. So do you see that as probably as a possible two for one deal, artificial gravity and uh, radiation shielding? Um, so I don't know enough about that radiation shield to answer that question. That's a that's a good question, um, and mm, I, I don't know I don't know how that works, like how they how they do the shielding, what the issues are. So uh, if you email me about it, I'll, I'll look it up and tell you about it. You know, tell you what I think later. But that, that's a good question. I don't know the answer at all. Yeah, good one though. Any other questions? All right. So let's talk about breakthrough propulsion. Uh, can you ask if there's any online? Are there, there any oh, oh, are there any questions? Oh, hang on, I had the volume down. Are there any questions online? Uh, Bert, can you go it up? Okay. Certainly before we, we end. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can go as long as you want, or until the library takes us out. <laughs> okay, so um, I, this is not a formal membership, but there's a, a group of us uh, that uh, meet regularly, and it's called the, the ZC Institute. So that's actually a company, um, a private company. ZC stands for Zephyr and Cochran. If you're a Trekkie, you know how that is, right? And uh, so the guy that runs the company and founded it, um, Greg Hodgkin, is very much passionate about warp drive. And so he approached us because he was aware that we had done a review paper on Warp Drive some years ago. And here's the story of how that happened. I went, I gave a talk like this to some freshmen and sophomores in a physics class, as I'm asked to do um, about once in every year, every other year. And then as I try to make my escape back to my vehicle, um, a student, you know, because they're faster than I am, got, tracked me down and said, I wanted to research with you on Warp Drive. And I just, you know, all of the consequences of that flashed before my eyes. <laughs> and 
and, uh, uh, and I, I said, well, I don't do that kind of work. Um, maybe you could do a review article. And so he did, and the thing is, he did an excellent job. This was uh, Joseph Axel, who did, uh, just wrote a really, really good paper. It was very well received at a conference. And then they did a press release, and that's, that's how the word got out. And then that created the perception that we were doing that work. And it attracted a lot of very interesting people. We'll just leave it at that. So, <laughs> as I anticipated, it would, because that kind of thing happens. Um, but that's OK. Uh, one of them was this guy, Greg. And he approached us, and we showed him what we were doing with dialectophoresis. And I, and I said, I, I know a little bit about warp drive, but not a lot. And he said, well, here I've got this vast library. I collect papers, and I'm always getting the new ones. And so that connection to him, that friendship, uh, made it very easy uh, and gave me no more excuses for trying to at least learn about it. And so I, I, I got a book on general relativity and realized how much I hate general relativity. <laughs> so you know, look at this equation and just look at the man who came up with these. He's just there kind of making fun of us, you know. Um, it, it looks like a simple little thing on the left-hand side. All this is is just the math behind the curvature of, of space. So space and time curve in this four-dimensional space but this thing generates 16 partial differential equations. And I, I don't know the exact number, but I think there's hundreds of different uh, multiple mixed partial derivatives that are part of what that giant matrix is. And then on the right-hand side, you've got some coefficients out here. This is SI units. And then you've got this thing called the mass energy tensor that says, OK, if you've got mass or dust or black holes or things that are spinning up and have weird energies, or if you have electromagnetic fields, they all can be devised to um, be put into this tensor to kind of tell you, OK, if this is your mass energy density spatial variation, this is how it's going to curve and you solve those equations. But the problem for warp drive, so Al Cubieri, I can't remember his first name, back in 1996 published a paper. Miguel. Miguel, thank you. Um, and when she came up with this, this space-time metric that says, OK, if we could curve space-time in which it expands on one side and contracts on the other, we could go faster than light. And the modern day uh, perception that we can do FTL warp drive propulsion was born with that paper. And ever since then, people have uh, worked on it to try to make improvements because in the original paper, he needed the entire mass energy density of the universe to generate this field. And so it, it seemed like it just was not possible. And people have chipped away at it until they've made it smaller and smaller and smaller. But the problem is this term, 8 pi g over c to the fourth. g, that's the gravitational parameter, that's Newton's parameter, that guy, uh, is like 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. It's an SI units, I can't remember all the, the units there. And then in the denominator, we have c to the fourth. You know, c is a big number, 3 to the eighth. <coughs> And so 3 to 8 times 4 is 32. So you've got minus 11 uh, <laughs> divided by uh, 32 makes it the coupling between mass and space-time curvature just impractical. And so it's like, so the math is really, really hard. And um, the coupling between mass and space-time is just terrible. And so it's like, God, why, why do I even want to bother with this? Um, then I found out there is a subset to uh, general relativity that is, now this looks harder because it, it, this, this is a lot more equations and it looks intimidating, but it's a lot like Maxwell's equations. So if you study Maxwell's equations like I've had to for uh, the, the version of fusion that we look at, this is not bad at all, believe it or not. So what this is saying, so this is one version, it's a subset of general relativity, it doesn't work for everything, but it does give you some intuition about where to look. This particular form of the equations was derived recently uh, by L.L. Uh, L. Williams and Nathan Enon, uh, some physicists that are kind of trying to take a, a fresh look at things. Um, some of you who follow warp drive or advanced propulsion probably heard of Ning Lee, who was a professor at UAA some 20 years ago. She did stuff like this, and before her, uh, Bob Forward and uh, Braginsky and maybe how put off, I'm not sure about that one. But anyway, the, the, this paper cites a lot of the usual suspects that, that have done this kind of thing. So anyway, what this is saying, uh, basically this EG term, this is the electric field, this is basically your standard gravity. This right here, this is, this is the EG term, and it's generated by, this is the in mass density, so you can, you can figure out how to convert this uh, from that to a mass source creating gravity. So this is your standard thing. 
there's this other little term that shows up, 3d squared over 2c squared, where c is the speed of light. Um, so if you can stir the pot, so to speak, and get close to the speed of light, you can kind of augment this a little bit. But, you know, nothing exciting just yet. And then there's this magnetic field light term, which turns out, have you ever heard of frame dragging? I'm sure some of you are physicists and probably know already what that is, but frame dragging is basically like uh, putting space-time in the blender. Okay, so the Earth spins and it actually stirs up those field lines a little bit and creates a new effect to it, and it's equivalent to the magnetic field, and they're, they're generated in a very, very similar way. It's sort of a relativistic effect, and it's created by mass current, but it's amplified by this coefficient which is 4 pi times that stupidly small number divided by c squared. It's like, ugh, what can we do here, right? Okay, but if you expand it out, and you consider this term up here, expand it out in terms of its electrical properties, eh, maybe we can do something, because c is not a constant. c is, um, as we've measured it, roughly 3 times 10 to the 8 in vacuum, but in materials, it's very different, and you can slow it down a lot. Um, so I think that's where one of the ways that we can improve on this because you have the relative permittivity and relative permeability, both of which can be very, very high in certain types of materials. And now that we have this magic metamaterial thing, we might be able to really engineer some, some fantastic uh, properties if we start looking. But in addition to that, if you start thinking about um, 2 mu g jm, jm is mass current. Well, where's all the mass uh, in a particle, it's in the nucleus of the atom. So if you start thinking in terms of, well, gee, that's just kind of like stuff spinning around really, really fast. So if we could maybe orient all the nuclei in the same direction, you know, that might give us a better coupling um, between our mass source and then these observed uh, fields. So I don't know if that's going to lead to anything or not, but that's where I'm interested in, in looking, is looking to see where material properties can give us an augmentation. So, so I'm not the first person to think of these things at all, um, but this is kind of the thing that I'm interested in, in looking at. So we're looking at this. There's always these wild claims that come out about uh, asymmetric capacitors. You know, some people, you have a can of say it's all iron wind, and some people say, no, 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 there's this magic part. If you do it just right, you can still see a thrust um, and all that. And so we have the ability to test those sorts of things, and so we try to position the lab to be able to look at that stuff just to see, because it's not hard to test. You know, we can, we can argue one way or the other, but if we can actually test it, that's, that's where the proof is. And so we, we look at those sorts of things. Um, there's an idea that we're going to pursue this summer that I'm going to telegraph, but if it's successful, I'll talk about it. That actually has nothing to do with this. So we're, we're always on the lookout for, for ways of, of cheating the rocket equation. So we're, we're, always, we're always trying to do this. But, but in terms of where you want to go with fields, in my opinion, this is the place to really look. Is to, is to look at this and think in terms of how can you get these material properties to be augmented in order to slow the speed of light down so that you can have terms like this to sort of augment and generate a, a, a more measurable uh, gra gravitational field. So, so that's kind of um, my thinking on the topic right now. We've got a lot of people in the world working on this problem in different aspects of it. Um, it's really hard sometimes to tease out what's legitimate versus what is frou-frou, if I can use that term. Um, but, uh, but, it, but it's all exciting because it, it seems like because of the way we can interact now with, with everybody using Zoom and, and, uh, and being able to go online and, and talk and exchange ideas, that things seem to be accelerating. So I'm very optimistic that uh, we're getting closer and closer to being able to, to do this. So um, with that, I'll just kind of wrap it up and, and glad to take all the questions you, you want. Um, so we're the Charger Bits Power Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, we're developing expertise in fusion, pulse power, and high voltage especially. And uh, we're really excited about dielectrophoresis. It's kind of our new toy, which we think we can make an artificial gravity environment for crude space flight. Um, it's also good for debris remediation and material separation and recycling. And uh, the main thing, most important thing, is that we're here to train our students while developing fusion sources, high voltage applications, and advanced propulsion for the next generation. So with that, thank you very much, and I'm glad to take questions. So, Bert, hang on. Bert, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Bert. Uh, if you could open it up for questions.
from Zoom first. Do we have to end the Zoom call right at 7 our time? Yep, uh, no questions have come in at this point. Uh, if anyone is online and would like to submit a question, please do right now. No. Go ahead. Uh, my question is um, uh, about fusion. You say superconductive magnets. Uh, there's material discovered on UH called YBCO. Uh, has that seen any application in any fusion devices? Um, um, the you're asking about the the barium copper oxide. Was that the was that the superconductor that was discovered at UAH? Yes. 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 Um, so I think that and derivatives of it had applications in breakthrough propulsion back in the '90s and early 2000s. I, at least I think it was similar because I remember people like uh, uh, Tony Roberts working on that. Because I because when I was a student and I got to work at NASA, I, I didn't do that work, but I got to be around it and see it and that kind of thing. In terms of fusion, it is now. Um, and I don't know if they were using superconductors for either. I think they were because basically you're limited to whatever the, the saturation magnetic field is for that material. And for either, it was like two or four Tesla. That's all they could get. It's a huge field, by the way. But, um, but with these new magnets, you can get to 20 or 40 Tesla, and it shrinks the volume down a considerable amount. So um, that's, I guess that's all I've got on that now. Is like it, basically, it was invented to do... Uh, mag uh, magnet fusion, the you know, magnet fusion energy, tokamaks, and things like that. Bert, do you have anyone yet? Nothing at this point. Okay. We have time for a few more questions. Dr. Cole, what happened to uh, the official, uh, what happened to Dean Lee? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> she, she had a, somebody ran over and she had an auto accident and she now was disabled and she uh, died in Huntsville. She never left Huntsville, she worked for the Army. Okay, I know she started that. her own pro project, her own company, worked for the Army. And uh, somebody ran into her, her husband actually had a heart attack when he saw her get hit. She was disabled the rest of her life and died a few years ago and has been buried. In, she's buried locally. I talked to Tony about a year and a half ago, and he was still doing papers on some of this. Um, this these, these basically, these, these some of the phenomena and some of these superconductors, and, mm -hmm. and he talked about this this phenomena that Ding Lee was doing. Mm -hmm. And you you talked about this the medium medium specific yeah. speed of light and the phenomena there. Um, it was interesting. He had more mechanical issues with building large discs. But I think they were going to go to a external methodology of spinning, uh, the, creating these vortexes. Did, did you ever work with any of those concepts? Um, I so I didn't get to work on it directly. I, I got to sort of dwell around them. So I got to see some demonstrations. Uh, between him and then I remember another guy, uh, Richard Eskridge, that worked over there, and he got he he did some really exotic stuff in which they generated these massive uh, 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 electric field gradients that just exploded stuff everywhere. And uh, I and then I remember he retired and formed a company, and I don't know what he did since then. I haven't really seen him in a long time, so I, I don't know. How I saw him about two two three years ago at UAT conference here in Austin. Oh really? Oh, okay. Talked to him a little bit, but it seemed like some some really interesting, you know, quiet stuff he couldn't really talk about. Genius guy. We oh yeah. We did high voltage stuff on a product with with Richard, and he would test our uh, high voltage uh, exciters. Oh, so you do you do pulse power? Uh, for detonation, we we do a lot of that. Oh, cool. So we have a product, and Richard helped test it. Uh, it's hard to get a true reading of the, the uh, you know, the, the joules out mm -hmm. without, because of your load. So yeah. he was doing that at NASA. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's a s small world. Oh yeah, yeah it, it <laughs> is, it is. Question about back. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, magnetic nozzles earlier. I guess, could you elaborate more on the type of fuel strikes you were seeing and if there were any interesting effects from different curvature or varying the curvature in the nozzle? 
So that's actually something that we're doing as part of our, our NASA uh, grant that we have now. That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> so if I'll go back to one of the pictures on that. All right. So first off, if you go with, you, you want to have something in which it's directional so that the, there's a, a pressure associated with magnetic fields like B squared over 2 mu naught, or mu naught is permeability free space. So you want a pressure gradient to point out the nozzle so the plasma goes that way, right? And um, when you wind a solenoid, which was, has been kind of the canonical description of what a nozzle would probably look like, um, we tried, tried, tried uh, with uh, different simulations to do that. And people done 2D MHD and never could get anywhere with it. They published and they said, well, you know, we're making progress, but then they just kind of quit. And so we, I, uh, I did what I, you know, I, I always like really kick myself when I'm in the middle of doing these things, and I'm glad I did it later. Um, but there was a workshop where I said, we're going to have the first demonstrated simulation of a nozzle. And uh, it was the night before, and uh, <clears throat> I still didn't have one working. And I just, I just kind of helped. And what was happening is the plasma runs into the solenoid field, and it creates these weird instabilities, and it just sort of catches the field. Or if you give it some um, motion, like give it a kick motion, just cheat, so send it out the nozzle to start with, it goes, <laughs> it comes back and sticks to the, the field. You couldn't get it to separate from the field. So I said, well, let me just try this way. I'll just wind it, I'll just make a, and actually I was a little more thorough with the knees. I, I took it and just went out with the cone and then came back and then down with it like that. And so those axial windings, um, actually it just worked. The plasma just went straight out and I got a good specific impulse. And so that was, that was kind of the birth of this new idea that we had, or so I thought. So um, one of the things that I do for fun is just get old electronics and take them apart. I just want to see what things are made of and what's in there. And uh, one of my favorite things to take apart is an old CRT based television. You know, people just throw them away and uh, drive my wife crazy. Uh, because uh, I'm like, oh, we got to get this TV, it's beside the road, you know, there's a flatback transformer in there I need, you know, she's like, oh, God, not again, you know, and so, so you get it, but anyway, woman, okay, so I took it home, take it apart, and uh, the, there's a thing on it called a diverter yoke, which drives where the electron beam shines on the phosphor screen, and that diverter yoke, when which the technology was developed in the 1920s or 30s, has those axial windings, so, so they figured this out 100 years ago. I thought I was smart, but yeah, no, they figured it out already. I just caught up to 100-year-old technology, you know, touching tomorrow with yesterday's technology today. That's our, that's our motto. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, but the windings are really super important, and it's not clear why some work and don't work yet. That's not worked out yet. It's open problem. Good question. All right. Thank you very much, Professor. Mm -hmm. Round of applause.